No. Okay, I need to go back. Okay, let's get started. Uh, so today we are honored to have uh, Professor Leo Gibbs from Stanford giving a, a talk titled Joint Learning of Geometric Data. Uh, Professor Gibbs, I think, is very well, well now. We, uh, we don't need an introduction. And so he is uh, leading a group of researchers uh, uh, in this amazing area called geometric learning in 3D. So welcome, Leo. Okay, Christian. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I also want to thank all the organizers, you know, Christian and Yasu and Yajun and so on, for inviting me to speak at this uh, 3D uh, graphics and vision uh, series. Um, so the, um, the topic of my talk is uh, joint learning over geometric data, and I'll elaborate on what this means in a little bit. But I want to say at the outset that this is collaborative work with many, many people that I will name as I go along. Um, let me start with some uh, motivation. Of course, we all know that uh, you know, deep learning had a tremendous impact in computer vision and other areas. But to a very large extent, this has depended upon having large, very large annotated uh, data sets like ImageNet in the case of computer vision, as well as a lot of processing power. On the other hand, there are many settings, especially in the geometry area, where getting quality human annotation is challenging. For example, if I show you the picture of this car, it's very easy to draw a 2D bounding box around it, the green one. But if you want to draw a 3D bounding box, it's considerably more challenging for a person to do that. And if you want to actually uh, estimate the pose of the car in terms of angles with some reference axis or planes, this is really very, very hard. And that's why it's important to consider learning protocols and architectures that reduce, minimize, or eliminate supervision. And there's been, of course, a tremendous amount of effort in this direction. And there are multiple names, uh, transfer learning, semi-supervised learning, future learning, unsupervised learning, and so on. And uh, to muddy the waters, I'm going to introduce one more, what uh, I and others call joint learning, that somehow looks more at the social aspects of learning. The, the basic idea is that uh, well, there are correlations, correlations between the data, the learning algorithm is training or testing on, uh, correlations between different learning tasks, and also correlations among the representations that are learned by different learning approaches. And if we can leverage these correlations, these connections, then perhaps A, we can do better and B, I'll try to reduce supervision because essentially these consistencies between the data, the representations, and the tasks provide supervision for the uh, for the learning problem. So in this presentation, I'll quickly go over a couple of examples of this joint learning idea. I'll start with some background on machine learning, and then I'll briefly go over multimodal 3D object detection category level object post estimation, latent spatiotemporal representations, and then consistency among learning tasks. These are all projects in my group and largely also with outside collaborators that I will indicate as we go on. And again, because I'm trying to give a high level overview, I will not spend any, I mean, too much time on any particular topic. But first, let me ask, what do these problems have in common other than they bring in a 3D understanding of the visual world? And what they have in common is that they require, what is the topic of this talk, joint learning. That is, they can, we can do better in these problems if we can aggregate information over many different uh, axes, over different data sets, over different modalities, such as geometry, appearance, or language, over space and time, over different representations, over different predictions, or over different tasks. In settings where all the above refer to the same entities in the world, and therefore, by definition, they are correlated. And the fundamental technical issue this brings up is how to aggregate 
information. And to aggregate information, we have to transport it to bring it to the same place. And furthermore, we have to put it in compatible formats so that the aggregation is possible. We have to have a consistency of representations. And towards this goal, I will discuss a number of technical tools in this talk, voting mechanisms, abstraction and canonicalization, and path invariance or loop closure. <clears throat> I should say at the outset that this consistency idea is something that was started maybe now nine years ago in some joint work with Chichen. And in fact, we have continued uh, to elaborate on that. And I think the whole notion of joint learning is something that arose in discussions that Chichen and I had. But the original work was simply a consistent shape segmentation work where the basic notion is any segmentation algorithm is based on setting thresholds. And this has the danger that, well, because you set thresholds, there may be similar shapes where you say segment the ears out of this teddy bear because they are big enough, but then you don't segment out the ears of this uh, other teddy bear with smaller ears. And how, how to guarantee this consistency and how to get supervision from this consistency is an interesting topic that in fact, uh, there have been many follow-on works, which for lack of time, I will not talk about today. But there's many other settings where this notion of consistency can arise. Here's an example of consistency among learning tasks. Uh, I show an image on the left, and then I, I, comp I compute via two different resonates, two derived images. One is uh, surface normals, the color indicates the normal direction, and one is depth, the you know, sort of uh, lighter colors are greater than depth. And you can see that they, they capture the geometric structure of this scene reasonably well. But if you look in some details here, you see that it's not so great, really. On the other hand, we do know that normals and depth are correlated. And in principle, one can be derived from the other. But we could also just train a net to take this kind of image and predict this kind of image, or vice versa. And then we can enforce consistency. We can, we can say that going from the image to normals should agree with going from the image to depth to normals. And this actually try, you know, does improve things as I show on the bottom. And I will cover this at the very end of my talk. It also makes sense to think about consistency at the representation level. The same way that in 3D, if we have multiple views of an object, we can combine them and do better. Here also, each representation can be viewed essentially as a platonic shadow of the real object. And if you have multiple such shadows, we can put them together and get better results. So that's the overall plan for the talk. And let me get started with some background. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about deep learning on 3D point clouds because I want to use point cloud data in a number of the vignettes that follow. So I'll, uh, of course, your point clouds are now extremely common. I mean, they have always been around sort of computer vision because uh, stereo and structure from motion can give us uh, you know, depth data. But now we have sensors like LiDAR and of course, all the low end uh, depth sensors from Intel, Microsoft and Google that give us point clouds directly. So point clouds are very close to the sensor. On the, and the representation is simple, it's just a bag of points. On the other hand, they are irregular. And that means the traditional convolutional architectures that have done so well in the image domain do not directly transfer here because uh, point clouds, every point can have a different neighborhood. And uh, that's, that's very different from images where it, it is just a regular grid. So some years back, we set out to build deep architectures that can get to uh, the same objectives as in the image world object classification, part segmentation, and so on. But starting with point cloud data, with regular point cloud data. And in doing so, we wanted to guarantee certain invariances, for some of which we were successful, and for others partially, and for others not at all. Uh, the most obvious one was uh, that uh, a deep net acting on a point cloud is a symmetric function. That is, it does not depend on the order in which the points are given. Uh, we also wanted to guarantee special transformation invariance. If you rotate an object, it doesn't change anything about the object. And we enforce that by an indirect law, so it's not perfectly true. And another thing that is still very open is sampling invariance. How to guarantee that the result of the net 
really is a function of the underlying object and not of the particular sampling that you are obtaining from it. Again, I'm, I'm going over this very, very fast. Uh, so the basic idea of the most vanilla point net is to simply aggregate the coordinates of the endpoints via some symmetric operator. If you do this in the most naive way, it's hard to see how you will get anything past some means or, 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 some, or some covariance or maybe some bounding box. Uh, and these really don't get to the semantics of the, of the point cloud. So the idea was, let's first of all learn a lifting from free space to some higher dimensional space, and then do this aggregation in that higher dimensional space via a symmetric operator. This was the key insight of, of PointNet and the basic architecture is what I show here, namely the sort of two stages, that is this lifting stage where we go from three coordinates to a thousand coordinates per point. And this is done by a set of stages of MLPs interspersed with canonicalizing transforms via T-nets, which of course in the point case, they're extremely easy to implement. And then comes the aggregator, which uh, and max pooling is what we used. And this actually computes the max of over these 1024 fixtures for each point, and it gives us a global vector of 1024 that then can be passed on to another small MLP for a soft max for output scores for a classifier, or this global vector can be combined with one of the intermediate per point representations to give us essentially a, a per point vector that is globally aware also because it has the global feature. This can be passed through another MLP and so on and give now per point classification scores as for example is needed in segmentation. This architecture worked and it surprised us because as you can see, there is no communication at all between the points until the very end. Each point is processed completely independently. So it was a surprising that we could do things like classification and segmentation with it. But of course, there are many problems where you want to know something at local scales, not just per point or globally. And that, and that led to point net plus plus, which is basically a recursive point net applied to local regions. You do hierarchical feature learning in, uh, in the most obvious way. I mean, you take your point cloud, I show here a 2D example, and you take a neighborhood around a point. And now you process this neighborhood by itself as a separate point cloud using a point net. And what this produces is a global feature that you associate with say the center point. So the so the outcome of this phase is to downsample the, the point cloud specially, but to generate many more feature channels. And so this is the idea of PUNET++ where you have so, so repeatedly this sampling and grouping and a point net, we call this a set abstraction layer. And you apply this a number of times until, you know, only a few points are left. So you can then aggregate them again using a symmetric the operator for um, for some for a task that involves the whole point cloud, or as before, you can go the other direction and essentially upsample again by interpolation and use the skip links to get per point information that's maybe needed for segmentation. So this was the basic idea behind the point and the point net plus plus, and of course it's all based just on the geometry. But but often we have both geometry and color, and in fact images um, give us very different information from point clouds. Images give us high resolution, dense coverage, but they're subject to many imaging artifacts. While while uh, a point cloud is typically sparse and low res, but gives us absolute depth and scale. So how to combine this in the best possible way is an interesting problem. Um, another direction I want to mention very briefly is the work I'll talk about is object centric. It's, it's saying that you can understand the world best if we can decompose it into stable entities we call objects. So, in my group for the last several years, and actually this also a collaboration with Chiching and a number of other people at Stanford and at Princeton, we've been developing ShapeNet, which is a large repository of uh, 3D models of everyday objects, things like furniture, chairs, um, tables, desks, cabinets, cars, airplanes, teapots, 
Uh, these are not models that we create. We scrape this from the web, but what Shapen does is try to provide semantic annotations of these objects. Um, so basically we generate part information and symmetry information, and then we associate say keywords with the object or its parts. And more and more are now focused on generating uh, functionality annotations, how people interact with objects because essentially all man-made objects, they are meant for a specific function. The getting the, the part information was a major effort and this, and, and this is also something that uh, is, is, a, is a kind of joint learning because uh, we annotated the, the subset of ShapeNet called ShapeNet Core, uh, about 30,000 shape, total maybe 90,000 parts. And this was done by using annotators that would paint on 2D images of this uh, ShapeNet objects, rendered images. And then this part information would be aggregated over, over many views and many users, pushed back into the 3D and then propagated to nearby shapes. Uh, so not every shape was individually annotated, rather most of them were done by algorithmic propagation and then human verification of the propagated annotations. And it's, an, it's an example of joint learning between humans and algorithms. However, it, it was rather coarse. So last year we introduced this partnet data set, which for a subset has very fine grained annotations. Here you can see every keyboard, every key in a keyboard is annotated. Here every slot of this trash can is a separate geometric object. And the reason that we were interested in this fine annotation is because a lot of human interaction with objects happens at the, at the fine part level because the human hand is small. And so, uh, so we essentially created these canonical hierarchies into which we can uh, try to fit objects of the same class, even though they have very different structure. Uh, this amount of supervision here is significant. And I think also this lessens the generality of this method, but it allows us to get to, to small parts and then downstream to interactions. Okay, this is the background I wanted to introduce. And now let me start discussing some of the joint learning examples that I wanted to use. Uh, and first I'll talk about voting schemes for object detection. And this tries to address the problem if there are many opinions about what something should be, how do we bring them together and aggregate them? The problem here was simply given a point cloud of an indoor scene like you see here. I would like to obtain bounding boxes for the individual objects and a semantic class. And here we went to a very old uh, computer vision idea, half transforms, only now implemented in a uh, fit forward and fully differentiable way, as I will show. So this is uh, again, this, this classic paper from the, uh, from the late 70s or 80s. This is the pipeline of the voting network. Uh, we have the input point cloud of the inter scene shown here. And then we do a down sampling. Essentially, this is furthest point sampling. These are these blue points. We select a well-spaced set of samples from the input. And now each of these blue points votes. It votes for the center of the object that it thinks it's part of. And these red points here are the votes of the blue points. These points, the red points are not points of the original point cloud that can be anywhere in space. It is where each of these blue points imagines the center of the box of the object that is part of is. And then in a the second stage, we take these red points by themselves, plus a certain feature associated with them that was computed by the first stage and process them again to then try to regress bounding boxes for the objects and do non maximal suppression and other standard tricks. So this is really two stages of processing. And you might ask, why do you do it in two steps as opposed to one? And we tried that and it didn't work very well because it's difficult for the point to know what neighborhood to trust at a very small scale, say at the tabletop, many points may look alike, 
But if you take a pod near the edge of the table in a, in a large neighborhood, now you now you are you're including points from the chair. And so it is useful to be able to aggregate many opinions to find the truth. And that's why the two-stage process, which is really two point net plus pluses operating back to back. So the first point net plus plus takes the endpoints and generates the votes. I mean, um, generates the for each blue point, the corresponding red point in the space plus the fixture vector for that point. The second point net takes this, this red points now, doesn't look at all at anything else and aggregates them to produce the object proposals and then doing the uh, non-maximal suppression. In a way, this partitioning into two stages is there because point net plus plus always aggregates points according to their spatial proximity. And if you have, say, a long couch and two points at the two ends of the couch, and these points want to share opinion about where the center of the couch is, this is challenging because they are far away. And in a point in the plus plus architecture, they will only talk to each other very high up. So effectively, we are implementing a sort of an informational routing scheme by moving the blue points to the red points. You can think of this as a very kind of trivial example of a capsule network where the, the information transfer is actually happening physically in space by moving the points around. And this worked quite well. Uh, I show here some examples of the vote net predictions. These images, they're just for you to understand the scene. Uh, they're not used by the network. And notice that the vote net actually found a chair that was not annotated. And it does well, even though objects can be very near each other, and even in complex scenes like this uh, scanned, scanned example. I will not show many tables in this in this work, but I wanted to show this one because it was surprising to us that the vote net works better than techniques that use both geometry and appearance data, the RGB color. And that somehow shouldn't happen because you know the more data that you have, the better you should be able to do. And it shows that combining geometry and appearance information is a little bit tricky. If you, for example, simply say, okay, instead of having points in 3D, I have points in 60. X, Y, Z, R, G, B, it doesn't work well at all. So we looked a little bit at how to combine voting using both 3D votes, which is sort of the part I just explained, and also 2D votes from the image domain. And uh, this is especially attractive if you have settings where the 3D data can be very sparse, maybe for example, in, in slum, say with orb slum, you may have some very sparse key points. Clearly it's very hard to find the objects just using the sparse key points, but by combining them plus images, then you can do the job. And again, I will not have time to explain the details of this uh, Imvot net that uses both appearance and geometry, but they're sort of two different pipelines, a 2D pipeline and a 3D pipeline that then get combined. And there's several other subtle and interesting things, but I will not have time to, to go into that. And this is some examples of how using the RGB also helps. Uh, for example, um, uh, you know, 3D scanning in general, at least the scanner we had doesn't do very well with dark objects, like this sofa, which is completely missing from the point cloud but with the image help, we can find it. And in fact, following this work, uh, teaching AC students had a follow-up paper, this H3D net, that said, well, the botnet paper just regressed the bounding box center, but one could think about the box in different ways. I mean, one could try to, to maybe regress the centers of the six faces or the centers of the 12 edges and why not do all of them and then combine them in a post-processing optimization step? And essentially, this is like computing multiple representations of the answer and, and thinking that maybe for depending on the data, some of them might work better than others. And indeed, this is the case because the way we see some objects, it may be much easier to, you know, to regress say, the center surfaces than the center of the object. And so by combining these multiple representations, 
uh, we can do better. Okay, I'm gonna move to the uh, second vignette, which is uh, object process estimation. Uh, another thing that we need to understand in an environment and basically the world around us. Um, and, uh, and one aspect that makes it difficult to estimate the part of an object in 3D is that the 3D scene where the object is can itself be very complicated. So an idea we had is why not simplify the problem and instead of positioning the object in real 3D space, let's invent our own 3D space, which is kind of custom made to be easy. You know, think that you have this car and then you have sort of this garage, so your garage where your car goes in always in a canonical way. It's much easier for you from the view of the car in an image to imagine where the car, the corresponding part of the car is in 3D if you have this canonical container. And this was the notion of this normalized object coordinate space where we normalize position size, but then also we realized this does not have to be specific to this one car, can be equally well be used for the whole category of similar cars. And since uh, in ShapeNet, we were lucky enough to have these co-alignments of, uh, of 3D shapes, we could in fact train jointly at the level of a category as opposed to at the level of an instance. And so, and this can be done not just for cars, but for many different categories. Here I show cameras and, and the coloring that you see here is simply uh, the colors represent X, Y, Z. So in this setting, we start with an object that is viewed by a camera and then we essentially you know, train a deep net to regress the X, Y, Z uh, values, not in real space, but in this simplified canonical space from which then we can sort of read out the, uh, the visible part of the object. And we used this to do a pose estimation in settings where we don't have a CAD model of the object, but we know the category of the object. So we know there's a laptop there, or we know there's a mug. So this is an interesting problem. In fact, even to, to uh, I mean, the, there could be even some, some question about whether the notion of category, I mean, of pose, if you don't know the CAD model makes sense. But at least for common objects, it seems that's okay. And what we did is we based the approach on a classic architecture mask or CNN, where in addition to the instance masks and the class label that mask or CNN normally produces, we added another head that essentially tries to regress the Nox map that I show here. And that together with the depth map produces the, the bounding boxes. This is one of the problems that I mentioned at the beginning where getting training data is challenging. And so to get to training data, we created this uh, data set, which is mixed reality. It has real scenes together with shape net objects positioned on top of real scenes. The real scenes come from IKEA. We scanned uh, 31 IKEA scenes as real backgrounds. And then on them, we place multiple um, uh, shape net objects, some as you know, detractors, um, to generate this large data set. We augmented that with a much smaller, you hand annotated data set of real world data, plus a whole bunch of Cocoa images without post annotations, just to pre-train uh, the Master CNN network. And here are some of the results that, that we got. I mean, if you say focus on this column, this is the, the input image. This is the Knox ground truth maps and the Knox predictions from the network. And here are the true uh, bounding boxes and the ones that we compute. Our motivation in introducing this canonical space is because it makes aggregation easy. In fact, aggregation becomes just set union. Uh, we were interested in capturing information about how people interact with objects. So one of my postdocs designed and built this five camera gantry that you, that you can wear while say, manipulating objects. And then each of these cameras gives you a different picture. I, I, I just show the hand here, not the object. Um, but then because of the canonicalization, it's possible to just aggregate these images in this uh, knock space 
simply through that union. And, uh, and very briefly, uh, uh, let me go over this next, uh, next elaboration of this work for pose estimation, where we try to uh, do pose estimation for articulate objects. So now it's not just rigid, but it can have articulations, you know, like an oven door opens uh, or a lamp chain can bend. Um, so here we complete the segmentation in a model part bounding boxes and part poles and also joint states and joint parameters and limits. And again, I'm gonna not go into much detail here, but the, the main novelty here was to have multiple canonical spaces, a canonical space for the whole object like before, but also separate canonical spaces for the parts. And this further normalizes the appearance essentially of the object that makes it easier to aggregate information. So now we have not a single, but a hierarchy of, of, of canonical spaces as I show here for this eyeglass model. So again, uh, very briefly, the pipeline here is you take say multiple instances of different eyeglasses in different poses. You canonicalize the articulation. So you make the temples normal to the, to the, to the lenses and then you align them and then you center them and then you scale them. And now essentially the job of the network has become much easier because, the, because a lot of the variability has been taken out. And again, without much detail, there's essentially two point at plus plus is at work here, one at the part level and one at the whole object level. Uh, this part regresses the part segmentation and the individual canonical spaces for the parts. This part regresses the canonical space for the whole object and, and regresses the, the joint types and values. Um, and the main point here is that because you have canonicalized the shape of the eyeglasses, now say this, these joints have to be vertical and because they are vertical, you are really estimating just the position of a point in the plane, as opposed to the position of some line in space. So it's a lot easier. And here we show some examples of the, uh, of the estimation. And, uh, and this is for synthetic data. And this works much, much better than previous methods when it comes to, to regressing the axis parameters. And it also works for real data, as I show here. And we are currently pursuing the same thing in a tracking sense. So as the sensor is moving or the object is moving, how to continuously track parts and the articulation state. In a direction different from continuous tracking, I'm gonna talk about spatiotemporal point clouds. Um, where essentially the observations may be very intermittent. They are not continuous. And this is clearly a problem that's important in uh, self-driving cars or in uh, learning so non-rigid deformations for robotics, mixed reality, AR, VR. Uh, and also the setting here is that in any one frame, we may not have enough points to really understand the object. Only after we aggregate enough frames can we possibly tell this is a car. So we want spatiotemporal representations of object uh, shape that are continuous in space time. They are robust to partial any regular sampling and can generalize to new categories easily. And uh, so the notion is that we want to be able to both do aggregation of these partial point clouds into the full shape, but also generate an encoding of the entire spatiotemporal trajectory of the car so that we can actually reconstruct what the car would have looked like even at intermediate unobserved times. So again, this is this Casper work where we this, again, this canonicalization now going on over both space and time that enables aggregation, but there's also a continuous representation of the motion that can be, that, that can let us reconstruct any frame that we like. 
So we take uh, these uh, inputs that they come in from a camera or, or a sensor, and then we put them into a canonical container, like before, where they can be aggregated. This is uh, the, the special part that we want to use in a way that can easily be analyzed to other categories. And there's a temporal component where uh, we canonicalize um, both space and time. The time canonicalization is very lightweight. We simply essentially scale everything to be between zero and one. And again, this is not for tracking right now. This assumes that we have that we have the full uh, observation sequence in advance. So this is the overall architecture of Casper. There's an input sequence of point clouds. And then we have this, uh, I'll explain this t-point net plus plus, temporal point net, that on the one hand gives us the canonicalized special aggregation and also gives us essentially a latent representation of the entire motion. What this network does in the special domain is it's actually a combination of a point net acting on the 4D data, X, Y, Z, and T, and a point net plus plus acting at each individual frame and put this all together. Again, there's a global feature, a local feature coming from, from the point net and a local feature coming from the point net plus plus. And this all going to a shared MLP that maps the point cloud we get from the sensor into this canonical space. On the other side, we have this intermittent canonical sequence and we would like somehow to represent the trajectory of the car so, so we can produce uh, yeah, unobserved uh, time steps. And, uh, and here, essentially, we have this latent representation that we get from an ordinary differential equation from a neural ODE. So we learn essentially an initial latent state and a network that implements the dynamics in this latent space that can then generate a, yeah, a latent representation at any point of the, of the trajectory. So these are the two components and the way they interact is as follows. Um, so the G, G0 generates this latent ODE. This actually has two parts. There is a static feature that represents the shape of the object and a dynamic feature that represents the motion. Uh, this is more subtle than I'm making it be. I mean, for a rigid object, this separation is very clear, but if you have deformation, then, then one has to think how so how do you encode the deformation of the object? Is it part of the shape or part of the dynamics? Um, so the way this, this works is how do we generate from a from a the, the latent code at time ti, the actual point cloud that represents what the sensor would have observed at time ti. And so for this, we will use uh, a continuous normalizing flow. Essentially, we will take a canonical distribution like a Gaussian distribution point cloud, and then we will use this as an encoding of how this point cloud will deform to what would have been the sampling obtained by a sensor viewing that object at the, at the observation time. Uh, the, the advantage of using a continuous normalizing flow as opposed to a non-regenerative model is that it's one to one and one can go backwards. That is, every point here has a corresponding point here and vice versa. And this allows us to implement the losses that we need, where essentially there's one loss due to the canonicalization and another loss due to the, uh, to the uh, normalizing flow, where we can essentially estimate the likelihood of each point that we generate here, because we can pull it back to the Gaussian that we had at the beginning. Yeah, as I show here. So what, I mean, this is still very, very early work and right now it's mostly working on a single object or single object plus background. We don't have the multiple object case yet, but uh, it can take these sparse point clouds 
that by themselves in any one frame don't make sense and start to make sense of them. Uh, and you can see the aggregation get pretty good results. Um, and can easily be extended to even shapes that have a very significant uh, self occlusion, like shares, as I show there. Um, yeah, let me skip the numbers uh, because I'm running a little bit low, low on time. Uh, it also can give us a uh, you know, camera pose estimation. We can, we can predict the, the motion of the camera that took these point clouds. And here you can see that we can start with very sparse data, three steps, you know, 512 points per step, and generate any construction that has you know, 15 steps and, and it's much denser because there's no point-to-point -point connection between the input and the output. These points came from sampling the base Gaussian distribution. And in the more so, in the construction, we can see sort of the center of the Gaussian, this red part. So it sort of tells us where the camera is looking because most of the points will be near the center of the camera. And as I mentioned, um, uh, this also works for, yeah, I mean, cars are fairly convex objects, so you may say it's easy there, but it also does okay for chairs and aeroplanes, which are much less, less, less convex. Um, there's many more applications of this. One that I wanted to mention is uh, label transfer. That is, if you annotate one frame of the sparse sequence, then because you can transport it, the annotations onto the canonical distribution, and then send them back out to the other frames. It's possible to transport annotations. So you can annotate any frame and somehow all the other frames get automatically you know, annotated. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, I think I'm running short on time. I have a, I have a vignette that tries to integrate uh, geometry and language. Um, I think that in the interest of um, finishing on time, I'll, 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 I'll skip this. It's basically based on collecting some data where we asked uh, this language reference game. We would show people three, same view of three chairs, person A would, and then select one of them. Person A would have to say how this chair differs from the other two. And then person B would hear the other ones and would have to select the correct. And so by collecting such data, we were then trained uh, neural speakers and listeners that could play the same reference game. And I will not um, go into any of the details, except maybe you can see here some of the, the types of uh, sentences that humans use to distinguish the target shape from the other two. Um, but what I want to come to in the end is uh, that first of all, we got to this to work with just regular images from the web. And these are sort of retrievals based on these textual descriptions. Uh, and there's two remarkable things about this to me. One is that uh, the network was never given any information about shape structure. It was given essentially a, a VGG latent vector from the image view and the point cloud vector from point net and the whole shape. The utterances that the humans used all contained references to parts, but somehow the network learned how to understand the part structure, which I found remarkable. It's also interesting that even though the network was only trained on chairs, it was able to also apply these retrieval requests to uh, other shapes. For example, if you, know, you ask for lumps with a circular base and you get this, but the network was never trained on lumps. Anyway, as I said, I will not have time to go into this. Let me finish with the last vignette, which is about the consistency for different tasks. And this is the example that I was showing earlier. And of course, one can use not just surface normals and depth, but many more modalities. In fact, here, this is all based on the Toscronomy data set where we had that, you know, 26 different vision problems. And the whole point now is that we don't learn separately, but rather we try to enforce consistency so that going from X to I2 is the same as going from X to Y1 to, to I2. 
<clears throat> and uh, this is a very, you know, kind of broadly applicable idea, um, essentially, you know, consistency between tasks. And, uh, and in general, you will have some, some graph that you try to enforce uh, a path invariance that going from A to Z by, uh, by this path should be the same as going by a different path. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, due to lack of time, I will not really have time to go into details. But again, you can see that when you use cross cost consistency, as I show here, you improve normals rather than computing them directly from the image, which can be very noisy. Here, I'm enforcing consistency between normals and depth. And here's more examples where here is without consistency and here is with consistency going via depth. So the bottom part is computing, say, you know, normals uh, directly. And this is computing normals both directly and indirectly through depth and, yeah, and enforcing consistency between them. This is another example where the intermediate is normals. <clears throat> and again, you can see the upstairs uh, videos with consistency look sharper and better than the downstairs ones. And here's some examples of many other paths that, that one can follow and how, and I'm sorry, here the bottom part is with consistency and the upper part is without consistency. The, <clears throat> there's many interesting theoretical issues here that I will not unfortunately have time to go into. One is, uh, I mean, the way I've explained this, it requires that you have synchronized training data for all the tasks. And that's sometimes difficult. So one thing we worked on is how to, to separate the losses so that you don't have to have consistent training data for all the tasks. Another is how to measure the loss, not in the pixel sense, but in a more perceptual way. And this helps if you're trying to enforce consistency with a task that you are not really that correlated with. And if you enforce it in a hard way, this may actually pollute the system as opposed to helping out. <clears throat> so again, the general setting is there are multiple tasks. We have networks that map between uh, the tasks. And we want to guarantee that, I uh, say, going from X to Y2 via this path gives us the same result as going via the other path. And in fact, uh, the loss in doing so, what we might call a consistency energy or maybe inconsistency energy is a better name, is a measure of how uh, consistently we are solving these tasks. I should remark that, um, but presumably, if, if we are doing things right, consistency will happen and then the consistency loss will be very low. On the other hand, the other direction is not guaranteed. We can have consistency without having um, the correct solution. And then we experimented with uh, many different data sets, including some that are very different from the indoor scenes we trained on, such as Apollo Scape, which is self-driving cars, or Cocodoom, which is video games and compared against many other ways of trying to get different tasks to help each other. And uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but uh, you know, the, the cross cost consistency gives sharper results than some of the competitors. What was more interesting to me is that, oh yeah, here is some, yeah, some more examples comparing uh, cross cost consistency against various other baselines. Uh, for example, again, GeoNet does similar mappings, say, from depth to normals, but not via a deep net, but via explicit geometric computation. Um, cycle consistency is simply the two-way cycles. Yeah, what's interesting is that uh, even when you apply this idea to uh, uh, very different images, like paintings or black and white and so on, uh, it's still is to produce, you know, decent results. And the very last thing that I want to end with is this notion that this uh, energy I talked about earlier correlates with quality of the results. In other words, the, the, the more consistent the results are, the more likely they are to be correct. And this gives us a metric that's fully unsupervised that allows us, say, to 
estimate how well we're doing when we go out of domain, when we go say from this indoor images to self to, to, to self driving car images or from the indoor images to uh, to Coco Doom. I show an example here where um, uh, here we are showing an indoor environment moving around and uh, at some point we'll start increasing JPEG compression. And then we can start see here that this uh, consistency energy starts to go up. And the and the higher the you know the compression, the more out of distribution we move, the um, you know the higher this energy is. So somehow you know low energy means that we are managing to uh, to get good quality despite being out of distribution. Uh, I need to finish. So this is an example with blurring that shows similar results. But let me stop here. So uh, I've talked about the notion of joint learning that combines a number of ideas. Uh, the power of abstraction and canonicalization that make information more aggregatable, more integratable. And of course, the power of aggregation and also the power of joint optimization across. Here, for example, we were optimizing both the joints and the shapes. And uh, I want to finish with uh, this uh, quote. Uh, Heraclitus was a Greek philosopher, lived around 500 BC before Socrates, and had a lot of famous aphorisms. Uh, and one that I liked, I've always liked, and I thought it's especially appropriate here, is he said that essentially, even though there's a common reason for things, a common explanation, many, and many here refers to uh, here to people, many live as though they have their own private understanding. I mean, one can think of what happened in the US politics this fall and, and, and apply this to this many you know, kind of you know, private understandings or multiple realities. Um, but my, the point of my, of my putting this here is to say that I think our deep nets have too much privacy, essentially. They develop their own private representations, which then don't talk to anybody else and stay in isolation. And maybe, maybe we can do better by having a more social network of deep networks that share information. Because ultimately, since they try to infer information about the same reality in the physical world, they should be able to benefit from each other because what they derive depends on the same original variables. Okay, I'm gonna stop here and uh, thank my group and my many collaborators in this efforts, also all my sponsors for this work. And uh, thank you, thank you for listening. Okay, thanks Leo. Uh, so we will have a two to three minutes break, uh, then we will start the panel session. Um, okay. okay, and okay. during this break, I want to announce one thing is that the three, so this is the last talk uh, uh, in this 3D GV seminar series this semester, uh, but this is not certainly not the end. We will continue uh, next semester with uh, also a wonderful um, list of speakers and panelists, and we will also try to expand uh, the the scope of this to uh, to to other um, like more relevant areas like robotics, like natural language processing, all uh, that are relevant to geometry and three D learning. Uh, so if you have questions, please ask on the YouTube channel. We we got two questions, and uh, uh, we also want to thank all the speakers this semester. Okay, so this is a really a wonderful. Uh, list of speakers uh, across um, uh, many different areas. Okay, geometry process, read vision, learning, uh, a little bit more core vision. And we also have more senior speakers and more junior speakers and uh, also all the wonderful panelists. Uh, we are very grateful for them. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for I also want to join as yeah. a co-organizer. Uh, yeah. I want to also thank Chishin. I mentioned this in the very first American slot, but it was cut out in the editing. So the whole idea started from Chishin. Uh, he got the idea 
uh, during the pandemic. And he talked to me on Facebook chat on one night. I got this idea. I thought that this is great. So I just started following his idea. So all the ideas about the, the workshop and seminar started from Chishin. So I want to kind of give the credits to him. Yeah, I, I should say Yasu, like, uh... The, uh, like we we covered very well. I think it's just really really expanded. So I think uh, expanded in particular on the vision side. Uh, this the scope of this seminar series, and the judging judging has uh, given a talk now serving as a panelist. Uh, so by the way, all the all the recorded uh, talks are on YouTube, and uh, uh, we also have a dedicated uh, Twitter channel for uh, for the. Um, for the uh, for the this uh, seminar series, okay. Likely, uh, I should say, likely we will continue, okay. Not just going beyond uh, next semester. It's likely that we will continue further, okay. Uh, and in the future, I think so. We as uh, we also discussed a lot with Yasu and other organizers. We will also have likely to have uh, sessions that are dedicated to senior PhD student postdocs. It's likely, okay, to have have those. Uh, in the future. Okay, so let's uh, start with the panel, and we have uh, uh, a couple of questions for, for Leo. Uh, okay. Is, yeah, so the first question is related to VoteNet. Um, so uh, Neil asked, um, was there a supervision on votes prediction as well, meaning the intermediate supervision on the votes for, for, um, for object centers? No, no. Because I predict the supervision was just at the very end. And there was supervision on the object class and the bounding box of the object, but there was no supervision at intermediate stages. Okay, thanks. So there's uh, another question from Alberto. So also work with Caspo. Do you see opportunity to create also 3D sync graph with T point net plus plus for improving indoor navigation? Um, I mean, uh, I think that uh, finding individual objects is like finding the atoms, right? In a same graph, you have a hierarchy. And I think a subsequent step can be to aggregate these individual objects into assemblies that make more semantic sense and can also be helpful for navigation because I mean, the information that you need can be different from objects. It can be, for example, where is the floor? And what is on the floor? Is there an obstacle on the floor? Or are there steps? Um, so I think, uh, you know, this is a bit less object-centric. But if you think of the workable surface as, as an object, then I think one can apply similar techniques um, to uh, detect um, uh, yeah, I think the it all depends on the supervision that you provide. I mean, the, you know, the same way there was masker CNN that found uh, objects, and then there was planar CNN that found planar surfaces, basically built on exactly the same backbone. Again, depending on what you train for in the end, you can apply the same architecture to, to you know, some different tasks. Okay, thanks, Leo. Uh, now I think we will open the questions to the panelists. Uh, maybe we start with uh, Jajin. Hi, hello, Jajin. So, uh, so, do you have any question related to, to Leo's talk and in oh. general? Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I, no, I think due to time constraint, Leo, you didn't really talk much about the language part. But I'm curious, you know, in general, how do you see uh, the connection to your language, do you think that's kind of a promising direction to integrate, uh, especially like uh, graphics and geometry processing with language or? Well, I mean, language is perhaps the most powerful tool we have to get to the semantics of things because that's how we communicate semantics to each other. Um, and so I think that whenever we can have language, it can try to push and tailor representations in ways that express the semantics better. I mean, I, I very briefly mentioned this in what I talked about, that somehow 
all the utterances that we collected refer to object parts and these nets were able to somehow respond to them even though they had no direct input about uh, object parts. I mean, we didn't really exploit that in any way, but it seems to me somewhere hidden in that representation must be knowledge about the structure of objects. And that's useful. And that was learned from language. It was not learned from the visual inputs. Um, okay. Okay, thanks, Leo. Thanks, Georgian, for the question. So, Yasu? I want to thank Leo again for the great talk. It's a great opportunity for me and us to directly talk to you. So I'm pretty excited. Uh, I have some questions, low level, high level, but from a low level first, uh, in BoatNet, uh, you mentioned that you add RGB, like input into a six dimensional and didn't work as expected. So I'm curious what was wrong. So it's about 3D vector encoding position XYZ versus 3D vector encoding RGB color. Can you give a recipe what you should do to combine image information and also geometry information? What, what was wrong with their procedure? Well, I think that the issue was that uh, XYZ and RGB express very different types of information. And if you just list them as six coordinates, uh, the network has to learn to use them in very, very different ways. And it, and I don't know how much capacity the network has. Um, I don't know if you if it was clear from my slides because I went over that part very quickly. The aggregation that we did in the following paper in VoteNet is all done at the level of votes. So, you know, you you process the image data by itself, and you essentially create pseudo 3D votes, not really 3D, of course, because you don't have the third dimension, but you can try to estimate a center in 2D and extrude it in 3D. So basically the aggregation happens in a geometric space. So we have forced both the point cloud side branch and the uh, image side to talk the same language, the language of points in 3D. And the aggregation happens in that space. So it's kind of English with English. Uh, they can be combined. The image domain was the convolution, was the operation of LGB data? Yes, yes, yes. Like, yeah. the, the image part was standard convolutions, but it regresses a, a, essentially an object, a 2D object center. It tries to regress where it thinks the projection of the 3D center would be in the image. Yes, yeah, that really makes sense. Really, LGB doesn't have any spatial information. Convolution right. is a spatial thing. Yes. But XYZ has a spatial. Then no exactly. key may work. Exactly. exactly. So do you think that say we use the circumvenant to turn LGB to some higher level latent representation, then add that to XYZ? So say uh, 64 dimensional higher level feature vector per pixel, copy that to XYZ, make it to 67 dimension, then do MLT. You just make the LGB to higher level. That's plausible. I mean, I, I think that, you know, we didn't do this experiment, so I cannot say how it would work out, but to me, this makes sense. Essentially, if this thing is trained end to end, then the CNN can try to learn to produce fixtures that will help in this page aggregation. Uh, so to me, this is very plausible, but we haven't yeah, done this experiment. You. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much. And yeah. my second question is related to this, LGB versus XYZ, or more MLP versus convolution. Uh, you mostly talk about the point clouds, XYZ, so MLP is the tool. Right. And I do more image data, so I kind of want to do convolution first. I believe in convolution. And then right. the MLP, things don't work well. But for your data, uh, say point cloud or CAD model, usually vector data, numeric values, positions. So MLP is a tool, but you can still convert into raster, say a volumetric 3D right. component style. Right. How, how do you see this uh, MLP in compact vector space versus the raster? I kind of go to raster straight and trying to read in raster space, then come back to vector. But you're more in yeah. vector straight. Yeah. Well, yeah, so there's a long story here. I mean, the, the, the earliest papers that try to do, say, object classification in 3D, they had inputs that were point clouds, but then they converted them to voxel grids because on voxel grids, one can just apply the traditional convolutional architectures. 
Uh, and to some extent they worked, but they were extremely inefficient, both because you have the entubed effect in the 3D and also because um, effectively in a voxel grid, you are forced to represent all of space, including lots of empty space or lots of space inside an object that is not useful in classifying the object, while the point cloud representation is much more economical. Essentially, you are paying your representation dollars where there is something to represent. And that was part of our motivation because we wanted to do something that is lightweight. Now, having said that, following the point that point plus, plus works, there was a multitude of papers that tried to do convolutions on point clouds in various ways. And in fact, we did some, some work like that as well, um, where essentially, you know, you don't try to quantize the point cloud, but you have somehow a continuous kernel that you define over 3D space that then gets convolved with, with the points. So I think today there's a lot of good techniques that can do convolution-like operations with point cloud data. So in this, maybe taking the best of the both worlds, uh, convolution yes. operations, the compact data, but maybe right. indeed, yes, a good idea. Yeah, no, there have been actually some, some very nice papers that combine uh, where essentially people use a coarse voxel grid and then a point cloud inside each voxel yeah. to capture more and local detail. My last question is, so earlier your talk started by saying that the 2D is easier to annotate. And 3D, it's hard, I also realize. So uh, for any 3D reconstruction, we can annotate. I'm trying to convince company to give me data, to have money to hire people to annotate, so it's difficult to negotiate. So many projects I gave up on 3D uh, reconstruction, the lack of data. Uh, but I guess still most of the work, uh, you still, we still need supervision, supervised yes. learning. And some others say that the self-supervision should be the future. So the core is self-supervision, and I think is the uh, supervised learning or reinforcement learning. But still, we are in the world of the core is supervised learning. Then self-supervision or cycle consistency is icing. That's somehow my impression. And I wonder how you view uh, supervised learning. We still seem to be heavily stuck in supervised learning. And there's no way out, at least in a few years. That's how I feel. And I want to hear your view of well, supervised versus this, unsupervised. This is a complex question and has many aspects. Um, the distinction I was making was not so much between 2D and 3D, but between semantic annotations and geometric annotations. I think humans are very good at giving semantic annotations because our brain perceives that right away. But you are asking for low dimensional geometric information then it's a lot harder, I think, for a human to produce that. But I agree that, that essentially, I, I, I mean, so, so obviously there's a need to have less supervision and um, there have been, I think, lots of interesting work in the last uh, four or five years on self-supervised techniques, both in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the 2D, with the image domain and the 3D domain and, and, and this um, kind of consistency, I mean, Everything I talked about today was different kinds of consistency acting as a supervision, consistency at the level of data, consistency at the level of tasks, consistency at the level of representations. Um, I think another direction where there hasn't been as much work as I would have liked is uh, you know, pre-training. I mean, like in division, sorry, I have to stop this call. Um, you know, in the image domain, it's very common that you pre-train on ImageNet and then you customize to your specific task. Um, well, we don't have anything like at the scale of ImageNet for 3D. So, and I don't think ShapeNet has been that much used for your pre-training or at least classification tasks. Um, I think there's another area where I think self-supervision can be, can be interesting. And also, I mean, I think in 3D, there may be more interesting ways to define the pretext tasks because there's more structure to the data that you have access to. I mean, in the image domain, typically people do what, I mean, you omit some part and you try to predict that. Of course, you can do that for 3D also, or maybe you shuffle the tiles. But I think perhaps in 3D, you can explore a larger family of pretext tasks 
that may have value. Um, yeah. yeah, actually, this is a very interesting to hear. The, I thought that the challenge of annotation is 2D versus 3D, but indeed semantics versus geometric annotation. That was actually very interesting to hear. So I guess in, in geometry, the CAD models, or maybe as Jajan touches, neurosymbolic code representation, okay, there are two aspects. First is more topological. We have, say, a plane, and then another plane. And we don't really care about the actual coordinates of things. I just know how, how things are connected. So these are yeah, easier for us to annotate. But that's yes. usually that's the exciting thing to actually infer. I don't care about coordinates. Roughly shapes are good. I'm excited. But maybe there's some opportunity. Uh, interesting stuff we want to learn are easy to annotate. Right. We want to annotate everything using coordinates. We, we are stuck. So there might be some opportunities uh, in that space. I remember talking to a, ah, what's the name? A, a cognitive or a neuroscientist in China, in Beijing, who's um, in a very interesting direction of his work, or result of his work was to show that somehow humans, human visual system can get, understand topological information faster than geometric information. And this is in some way very counterintuitive because geometry is kind of local, topology is global. You think that to understand topology, you first have to understand all the local things and then aggregate them into the global structure. But he had experiments where he would show, I don't know, people these dot patterns of various kinds, kind of very, very briefly, like milliseconds or whatever, and had them sort of respond to questions about what they saw. And somehow, the, you know, they could say, for example, if something has a whole, or maybe it's two components. Well, if, if you ask the difference between a circle, you know, something around or something square, they have difficulties. So I think it's interesting to ask how would we can get uh, very fast this kind of global uh, structure. And, 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 and I think this kind of supervision may be, may be easier for people because it's more global and more qualitative than uh, quantitative. Um, that actually yes, makes sense a lot. When I was doing multi view study a long time ago, before deep learning came in, uh -huh. we're already superhuman. We can tell seven millimeter accuracy, the few right. numbers of images quickly. So you're already beyond the superhuman. Right. But once you go to some topological, it's really a struggle <laughs> for a long time. So actually, that sounds very natural to me. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, that's all other questions uh, from my now. Okay. Uh, thanks, Yasu, for the questions. Thanks, Leo, for the answers. So, so I, I, as the like uh, organizing this uh, uh, seminar, so I, I prepared the two questions. One is very general. Um, so one is more, more technical. So in the, for the general question, um, uh, imagine that if we, so for, for a new student who want to work in this area, right? So in particular working with uh, you, what do you recommend in terms of this kind of pre-training? What is kind of like a classes, like the knowledge uh, uh, the student need to have in order to work with each of you? Like, certainly, so why I ask this question is that because if we think about the deep learning, right, the core vision, the, there are a lot of uh, established software packages like PyTorch, like uh, TensorFlow, right. Right? pretty much like high school students, they like download some data set, that they, they get to know the software, they can do the programming, they can even publish the papers, right? We have seen a lot of this. But certainly this is may, may not be true for this particular area, right? 3D vision, we, we require a lot of uh, geometric knowledge, right? So I would like to uh, hear like uh, your, your comment, maybe starting with Leo. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that uh, the danger now is that uh, you know, graduate students don't have to know anything. They just uh, collect some data, define a loss, and uh, have a result they can publish with a table with some bold numbers. Uh, but, uh, uh, I, well, I think that, uh, I mean, if you take what uh, Yasuk was saying earlier, that annotation in, in 3D is hard, this means that we have to somehow exploit more the structure of the domain, right? That we cannot just count on having free annotations to do the training for us. And it's not even clear that, I mean, it seems to me one thing that has not been explored very much is how the structure of the task should affect the structure of the network. Of course, I mean, deep nets are kind of universal 
approximators. But still, it seems to me you can do better by tailoring the architecture to the structure of the task. And I think I haven't seen really any, any good work in, in this direction. And the people who do architecture search, they do some random, I mean, the search of the random architectures without really using the structure. I mean, what is the structure of the task, right? And how do you define that? Um, so I, I think there's many good examples now of uh, uh, works in 3D vision, for example, that combine classical geometric ideas together with deep nets. Essentially, um, I don't know, uh, the fundamental matrix estimation or, um, so, so, you know, if you give me eight good correspondences, right? I can give you the, the perfect answer, but how, but how do you find the eight good correspondences? Well, maybe a deep net can do that because it understands the noise in the data and the noise patterns. And there've been several papers, I think, that now combine classical approaches together with deep nets. And I think that's a very interesting direction to explore further. Um, um, I mean, uh, you know, we had this paper at CVPR last year on, on fitting primitives to, to point clouds. And uh, I mean, this is a classical task that you can solve by ransack if you have clean data. But then there's all these hyper parameters that you have to set at the beginning, which make it you know, quite painful, sometimes impossible for us to work well in all cases. And that's an area where a deep net somehow can learn the patterns in the data, the noise, and then not have this issue. So I think it's an interesting place to combine more classical techniques with yeah. deep nets. Okay, thanks, Leo. So maybe we we open this to to judging. So if so, if what would you tell for the student who want to work with you, right? In terms of this, like the knowledge set and skill set, and uh, what's your perspective on the exciting areas? Um, see, uh, well, I think I'm interested in you know how uh, does how we can integrate. Uh, all those prior structure of uh, domain knowledge with you know learning systems that we can you know make learning system better but also improve uh, over classical algorithms. So to do that, you have to know both how AI learning works, also how what are these domain knowledge that we can still you know get inspiration from. Uh, of course, you know some of them they probably should be replaced, but they're still like very important. Um, I would say very universal structure that people have developed over decades in vision and in graphics. And that could be very useful um, in when we were now building these kind of hybrid intelligent systems. So, so I think, I hope the students can you know, have background in, in both AI learning, but also has you know, taken courses implemented in um, uh, uh, not algorithms or methods in vision and graphics. And it, unfortunately, <laughs> I mean, I guess that's a trend. It, it's much easier to find the students who are experienced with PyTorch and TensorFlow. It's much harder to find students experience with uh, 3D vision or graphics. You know, I think I said it maybe somewhere else is, I think when I was interviewing PhD students earlier this year, is everyone is familiar with <laughs> TensorFlow, PyTorch, but many of them, when they're, they're like already in the final round, so with a very fancy CV and everything, and they're not, they don't know what is a uh, Montevideo stereo. So, so that's, uh, or they don't know the difference between Montevideo stereo or and structure from motion. So that's kind of unfortunate. So hopefully um, people can um, get familiar with, you know, both. Um, both. Yeah, thanks Jardim. Maybe that, that really suggests that maybe this uh, 3D GV seminar series can dedicate some of the slots to this kind of tutorial type of stuff, right? In short, yeah basic concepts of 3D vision and 3D learning, right? So, so we'll try to organize that. That may be maybe helpful for the students who want to work in this uh, area. Okay. Maybe, um, Lou, maybe, you, want to maybe you can yeah. invite some, some of the old timers to give essentially the kind of lecture they would have given, you know, 30 years ago or something. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a multi-view stereo or, I don't know, some, some classical problem, I mean, like, you know, Kind of jump on some here. I would love to give a lecture like that. Uh, yeah. Go over some classical geometry that's important in computer vision, uh, yeah. and it now has been forgotten or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I think we will we will do that. Think about it. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Yeah, Yasu, do you have a comment on this? You <laughs> have a lot of say. <laughs> yeah, tough question. Only after my answer, Jesse can also share how you prepared yourself to be a successful Yale student uh, before. So uh, I, I see students who are good at the coding. Uh, Jaja mentioned the PyTorch or TensorFlow, uh, lots of engineering. And uh, I often want to train my students in kind of a reading papers in depth. So there are many papers, uh, lots lots of papers every year, but often some can't really tell the essence. So I was fortunate to be in a group where uh, the supervisor trash papers. This idea is like a nonsense, but doesn't make sense, it's just numbers. So don't pay attention. I often say that to students. So maybe train to read in depth and criticize. So kind of typical are students who cannot read in depth, can read everything. And just, oh, this is great, numbers improve. But our, often you experience, you can tell these are like a bad idea. Maybe most of them are bad ideas. A few are kind of good, shine to your eyes. So kind of try to criticize the papers and see what's good, what's bad. Maybe try discussing with a friend or maybe your supervisor. Uh, that's I kind of want to be trained well uh, when one starts. So that's uh, my answer. Okay. Okay. So I think, uh, thanks, you. So I think uh, the common uh, uh, information here is uh, that we we need to train students with certain with necessary background in three D geometry, right, and and machine learning three D representations, right. So I think those are the foundations for 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 this uh, for this particular field. Okay, okay. So I have a second question, which is uh, a little bit more technical. I think uh, the, we are in the very, very, this very nice space of deep learning applied to geometry, geometry, right? So, and uh, if we call this as a, as a basic field, I think there are a few relevant fields that are also emerging, right? For, for example, one of them is uh, differential rendering, right? That, that really connects the, the 3D domain to the 2D domain. I think, Jiajun, you, you work on one of this. Um, uh, I want to get the opinion uh, on each of you regarding this, the connections between this kind of 3D learning and also some, some, some relevant uh, domains, right? In particular, uh, differential rendering. Maybe I think this time we start with judging. So, uh, so uh, yeah, um, let's see, how, how do you put it? Um, so I think you know whenever you want to combine some existing things and like simulators, simulators can be a rendering engine, can be a simulation engine. Uh, with learning, I think to me there are several several ways that learning can be helpful. One is uh, one is you know you can just take an existing uh, rendering engine and then just make it differentiable. And here it's not even there's even no learning required, but you can use it for learning because now you made it differentiable. Then think about it as a as an auto encoder, the decoder part is not differentiable, but then you can now train an inference algorithm as the encoder so that you can you know, invert your inverse rendering and then, then to tie that with those now differentiable uh, renderers. Um, but there are other ways that learning can be helpful. For example, um, sometimes learning can be, or rendering can be very slow. So if there's a way that, you know, we can use learning to approximate it to make it faster. That might be useful. Although I feel like these days, you know, with all those implicit rendering, implicit representations and new volume rendering, it actually make the rendering even slower. <laughs> so, that's a, so, so that's kind of a challenge that you know, learning-based rendering has to be made faster. But anyway, I think I think learning can yeah probably you know you can use it for inference. You can possibly make rendering faster and. Um, uh, uh, and also you can use learning to approximate and uh, to do things that uh, traditional rendering methods cannot really do well or can, they can do well, but require specifying things that are very hard to specify. For example, the BRDF, you know, it's, it's, it seems hard to really specify what's the material of that thing and how to make it compositional, but maybe maybe there are things that, we, these are things that we can use learning to approximate. Um, so think about the role of learning and, um, and, and things that we already know that we can write write down as equations like like transport and to uh, smartly integrate them as I feel there is some potential there. Okay, thanks, Jiajun. So, so for Leo, I would like to ask a very specific question is that what do you see the role of differential rendering in, the, in this joint learning framework in terms of connecting 3D data and 2D data? Well, I mean, the basic, uh, I mean, the great utility of differentiable rendering is it allows you to give to the supervision to 3D algorithms because you can uh, you have you know millions of images. It's a lot easier to supervise with 2D 
than with 3D. So I think this is a very, very basic functionality that you get from differentiable rendering. I think that uh, the issue of differentiability is a more general uh, challenge, I think, for uh, geometric machine learning. I mean, even what we talked about today, VoltNet, I mean, the standard half transform is really a clustering algorithm, and as such, it's not directly differentiable. Mm -hmm. So it took some twisting to try to find an equivalent formulation that is differentiable. And I think mm -hmm. the question that's in my mind is, you know, are there some principles about how to do that? Uh, how to somehow, I don't know, move into a more differentiable form uh, a given algorithm? Um, and, and I think there's a whole spectrum of having something which is fully differentiable, something where you can do a, like approximate numerical derivatives. Uh, people have used that a lot. Um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so the general question what Leo raised is that is there really like this kind of library or dictionary or framework for addressing the differentiability among geometric operations, right, for, for, for the machine learning tasks. Right, right. I think, I think it's a very good question. I mean, yeah. So when, yeah. can you go through the standard library of geometric algorithms and say, what would you take? I mean, how many different tricks do you need to make them all differentiable so then they can be plugged in to, uh, to deep architectures? I think yeah. that, that, that uh, yeah, I would definitely love to see a thesis or two on this topic. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Leo. So Yasu? Uh, maybe I consider differentiable rendering to be uh, one of the tools which can make a breakthrough, but not everything. Like a typical use of differential rendering, say I want this in VLDF, I don't have a ground truth. So I have an encoder image to VLDF parameter. I have a special differential renderer which can interpret VLDF parameter, make an image. So I, I can learn to estimate parameter without supervision, so some form of unsupervised by having special structure. That's one typical way to use. But I often work on a problem where even with full supervision, I cannot recover, say, CAD model representation. Even with full supervision, I cannot solve. So differential render is a way of somehow solving without supervision. I have a problem which you can even solve without super, with, with supervision, I cannot solve. So to me, that's one of the tools. So when you use differential rendering, the key is how to, say, represent VLD parameter and how to use the representation to design differential renderer. That's the key. So kind of representation, how do you represent the core architecture before renderer? And how do you use in differential render together is like a set. So kind of one of the tools, you have to be careful to do things right. So that's how I, I see it. OK, thanks. Thanks, Yasu. Yeah, OK. Uh, so time is running out. Uh, really thanks, Leo, for the for the wonderful talk covering all the many aspects of uh, the state of the arts at the intersection of 3D learning geometric representations. And then I think we had a wonderful uh, panel discussion covering many aspects, right? So I think the, uh, I remember that we, uh, through the discussion, right? So we, uh, it would be good to have, uh, like uh, to dedicate some of the slots here to, to, to cover some of the tutorial material for uh, 3D vision and geometry. Uh, then I think Leo mentioned, right, it would be good to have uh, a thesis, right, on addressing the differentiability of a ge geometric uh, operations, right, so for, 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 for 3D vision, okay. Okay, thanks all for, atten uh, for attending and thanks for, for the audience on YouTube, uh, also for the, for the two questions. Uh, so this concludes the seminar series for this semester, and we will continue next semester. Okay. Okay. See you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much Thank for putting this together. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. Thank you.